This week on Motor Week, we look at a selection of motors suited to that modern icon, the hairdresser. For those wanting a bit of wind through their own silken locks, the BMW Z3 and the Chrysler Sabring. For those feeling a little bit butch, the Rufty Tufty Toyota RAV4. And for those feeling a little flash, Ian Royal's used car delight is the Jaguar S-Type. It's got everything going for it. A prestige badge with an excellent sporting pedigree, a wide choice of engines and fabulous build quality. But isn't it funny how hairdressers always fancy little open-top sports cars? I mean, they're hardly the best thing for maintaining an elegant quaff. Somehow, despite having everything in its favour, the BMW Z3 still manages to be, well, a bit of a girly chariot, really, one for the scissor jockeys. Now in its advanced midlife, the Z3 is due for replacement early in 2003. So has the old girl got anything to offer, or is it really just a bit of a blue rinser? I've never had a big problem with the looks of the Z3. I mean, sure, it is a bit well endowed in the bonnet department, if you see what I mean, but it's no swamp donkey. The problems start when you get in here. I don't mean this outrageously tarty interior, and boy, is it ever tarty? And I don't even mean the driving position, it's just the sitting position. I don't settle into it. I'm more sort of perch on it, which is a bit weird. Rather than settling in to peer down that long bonnet, I'm worried I might fall off. And then there's the drive. Oh dear. The engine's great beyond reproach. A growly three litre straight six giving 230 brake and 0 to 60 in just six seconds. No, the problem in fact is the body. No control, darling. It's a bit wobbly. In fact, if you chuck it down a stretch of anything other than perfectly smooth tarmac, it'll shake and shimmy more than a hairdresser at an ABBA concert. Not good. But hold on there, Nigel. We're getting this all wrong. It's not about dynamic performance, huge cornering speeds, lift-off oversteer, or progressive breakaway. Z3 drivers don't know about these things any more than I know about pin curls, chignons, and thinning scissors. It still, to my mind anyway, doesn't look bad with its long bonnets, sharky inlets, newly flared arches and stunted little tail. Admittedly, it's not as chunky as the Mercedes SLK, but then it is slightly cheaper than the Merc. But it doesn't look anywhere near as sharp and modern as Honda's fabulous S2000, which also costs less and goes faster. In a sector in which fashion is all, the Z3 is starting to look its age a little. The interior, though, still stands up to close scrutiny. The red leather here might look like something out of a catalogue for consenting adults only, but the build quality and funky retro feel still work and will stand up to some pretty serious wear and tear. But if the Z3 does one thing to come close to winning back my affection, it's this. Leave the lights on with the ignition off, and instead of the usual annoying beep, you get this. It's great. Sounds like a sub's klaxon. <laughs> you could get yourself a Z3 for as little as 18,900 quid, but that is for the pitiful 1.9 litre version, and frankly, it's quicker to take the bus. The top spec M version costs 36 grand Porsche Boxster money, but this one, the straight six three litre sport, weighs in at 27,730 pounds. If you are tempted though, haggle for your life and don't forget it's being replaced next year, which will hit values of the current model. If we're honest, whether it's powered by a straight six, a straight four or a hood dryer, the Z3 is all about posing, looking good. I actually like open top cars and I'm always prepared to forgive a little bit of body shape for that wind in your hair sensation. It's really not often that BMW build a baton, so when they do, we really mustn't miss the chance to stick the boot in. The Z3, flawed from the start, is now looking sadder than an MP's comb over, and even the hairdressers amongst us should look elsewhere.
See me, right? I'm mental. I'm bonkers. I'm the one in the office that organises all the days out, drinks parties and paintballing and that. Still brilliant, not everyone comes. Everyone says I should be on telly, me. I don't drink or take drugs or smoke or anything like that, but I do like to play badminton and do a bit of mountain biking at weekends. And I like to drive a car that reflects my personality. That's why I drive a RAV4. A car so crazy it could send you to sleep. A bit like the office comedian. I don't like RAV4s, or more importantly, I don't like the people that drive them. But I've got a confession to make. I've never driven a RAV4, but I don't think I've got to have done something to know I'm not going to like it. I've never Morris danced. I've never tenderly caressed another man. And I've never driven a RAV4. Well, today I'm going to do one of the above. Here we go. Yeah. No, it's driver RAV4. This is the second generation RAV4 introduced in 2000 and the range includes a two wheel drive version but more of that in a moment. This is the RAV4 five door top of the range VX model. The interior of this car is surprisingly okay and in terms of space it's hugely flexible. In the rear, well the seats can be very versatile. You see if you want them to they'll uh, slide backwards and forwards the back easily folds over. If you want to, you can even fold it right up and ultimately, I can just do this. Remove the seats completely, giving it MPV style adaptability. But have a look at this, they've ruined it. You see at the back, this low load sill would be ideal for getting in big items, but look at this, it's ridiculous. That is as far as the door opens. It's huge, it's heavy, reliant on two small hinges. Why it can't just pivot there, I've no idea. Bonkers. A bit like me. Now the interior cabin space I quite like. It's very Toyota, but I don't have a problem with that. The instrumentation and dash are clear, modern, functional, but they're not going to set anyone's pulse rating. In terms of fabric and texture, they have tried to alter it a bit with some kind of mock carbon and metal, but rest assured, it's all very plastic and how. The luxurious leather seats are bobbins. There's no support or comfort. Go around a corner at any speed and you'll find your passenger sitting in your lap. And, well, the steering wheel is leather. That's nice. Now, Toyota make bold claims about the RAV4 being a bit of a hot hatch. Well, let's put that to the test, because, quite frankly, I don't believe them. First up, there's the impressive engine. It's a bit like a noisy child with a bit too much to say for itself. It's a two litre, 16 valve, double overhead cam with variable valve timing. But the RAV4, impressive though it is, is driven by hairdressers. Or more specifically, people who live in Milton Keynes. who practice judo and they buy their clothes, those baggy patterned slacks with the elasticated waist in the back of the colour supplements. People with no style, stiff squares. Still, I quite like it. You see, when one of the cars in the RAV4 range is only two-wheel drive, I don't think you can take it seriously as a soft roader, let alone an off-roader. It's a lifestyle car. But, and this is where I have to be objective, in its class, I don't think the RAV4 can be beaten for drivability and value. So there's something I didn't like, tried and liked. Now for Morris dancing and my friend Pete. I'll see you later. Have you ever dreamt about owning a real classy motor, one with breeding and pedigree and a long history, and one that goes rather well too? Well, there's really only one car to go for, a Jaguar, or as it's more affectionately known, a Jag. Now, you could go for one of the big XJ saloons, but I think the better car to go for is this, the very nice S-Type and prices are beginning to tumble on these cars now, which makes them very good value use. 
Take this 3-litre SE Auto, for example. When this car was new, just over two years ago, it had a base price of £34,750 without any extras on. Still a lot of car for the money. But now, two years on, with average mileage on the clock, it could be yours for less than twenty grand. This is one cheap Executive Express. Put a private number plate on this car and no one will know it wasn't brand new. The S-Type was launched in a blaze of publicity in late 1998. We'd been teased about what the new car was going to look like, shown pictures of the classic Morse Jaguar from the 60s, and big hints that the S-Type was going to be retro, and they didn't disappoint either. The S-Type still looks good, and although 2002 models have had a bit of a tweak inside and out, along with a change to the engines, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference, and that will only make two or three year old cars even cheaper to buy. I love the look of the S-Type from the front, this grille, the lights. Sometimes chrome can look a bit naff on cars, but not on this. Round the back end though is perhaps this car's biggest letdown. It kind of looks sort of okay, but it's not brilliant. However, it has got a decent boot on it. I mean, golly gosh, you could probably get three or four sets of golf clubs in the back of there, which is an absolute must when you have a Jag, don't you know? Inside, the cabin is sumptuous, as you would expect, perhaps not quite as much so as with the bigger XJ saloons, but nice in here all the same. And rear seat passengers benefit from more space than they do in the bigger Jag, surprisingly enough. Inside, it's all leather and wood trim. It's very, very nice and standard Jaguar kit. Also, some important points to remember, if you want to buy an S-Type, make sure it's got an automatic gearbox and leather trim rather than cloth trim, because they're harder to sell on in the future. Also look out for the higher spec cars, things like satellite navigation, the upgraded stereo system and the cat suspension. They cost a lot to add as extras when the car was new, but don't add too much extra value if you buy one used. Now is a great time to buy a used S-Type, because prices really are tumbling. If high mileage doesn't bother you, a V-Reg 3-litre auto with 72,000 miles from a main dealer with full history, a bargain at less than 16 grand. £17,000 will get you a 36,000 mile V-Reg 3-litre, or if a V8 is more up your street, well how about £19,000 for a 60,000 mile 2000 car, or 20 grand for a V-Reg. The sport models in the range cost more, but 22 grand will get you a 3 litre Sport and 28,000 pounds a V8 Sport. Main dealers always have the nicest car and you can search online through the whole network, but the better specialists will also have one or two decent cars. Whenever I mention to my wife that maybe it's about time we ought to change the car and perhaps we ought to get a Jaguar next time, she'll give me that no way Jose, I'm not driving one of those looks and starts rolling her eyes a lot. Maybe that's just a mating call though. Anyway, whatever it is, she doesn't like Jaguars. She still has that sheepskin coat Arthur Daly image of these cars and nothing can dissuade her. Despite the fact that Jaguars these days are reliable, well built and stylish. Criticisms of this car, well, few and far between. The steering at times can feel a little light even at speed, but the brakes are very, very sharp. Just think, for the same price as a brand new Ford Mondeo Gear 2.5, you could have a Jaguar S-Type like this. This car has done just over 20,000 miles, it's two years old, and it costs less than 20 grand. In my opinion, there is no comparison. And if it's your hard-earned cash, this is where it should go. It still has a year left on the standard three-year warranty, and this is one really good buy. Driving a Jaguar is a special feeling, but owning one is even better. Forget about the big XJ saloons, buy a used S-Type instead. That's this week's One Careful Owner. After the break, we go direct to Japan, where Toyota are trying to invent the ultimate concept car, I think. Oh no, please don't make me. Oh, don't say I've really got to. I can't have to. Please. 
just don't want to. Where is the thing? The funny thing is, I don't know why, but I really, really don't want to drive it. Please don't make me. But it shouldn't be that bad. It's a big American four-seater drop top. Sounds positively tempting. But this, of course, is the UK. And we do things differently here, especially the weather. Ah. The Chrysler Spring. That's spring, like a cash register. Not that the tills at Chrysler UK have exactly been ringing with the sales success for the Spring. Sales so far in the UK amount to, oh, let's see, um, none. And it's all down to communication, I reckon. Imported here from its native America, the Sabring is a dog trying to communicate in a land where we speak cat. It's full of conflicts. For a start, it's dressed up in bodywork to make it look menacing and aggressive. Whereas in truth, it's about as menacing as the Easter Bunny in combat kit. You ain't fooling no one. And what about those looks? They lead us to anticipate something pretty fiery under that rakish bonnet, do they not? Ah, well, brace for disappointment rather than G-force. What we get is a wheezy 2.7 litre six-cylinder unit. They claim it pushes out 200 brake horsepower, but it really doesn't feel like it. And if you push the revs to anything like an energetic or sporting pace, it simply packs up, sits down and lights up a fag. They claim again that it will do 0 to 60. And they claim that it'll do it in about 9.9 .9 seconds. I'm going to find out with me at the wheel, I can tell you. And then there's the luxury. Americans like to be cosseted, don't they? Plenty of padding for those great big burger butts. Well, yes and no. They like to look like they're being pampered, whereas in fact they're enduring levels of discomfort and ergonomic compromise harsh enough to make a submarine captain squeal. Under redeeming features, we might find, well, it's a nice colour, and you'll be the only one of your friends that's got one. If it is an unmitigated disaster to drive when it comes to considering the finances, it's time to head for the nuclear bunkers. 22,950 quid is the figure on the price tag. Shell out another three grand and you could have the lovely Saab 93 convertible with its sporty image and rock solid build quality and it's faster too. Or for that money, you could have the Volvo C70 Cabriolet. Very pretty and possibly as exclusive as the Supreme, but that's exclusive in a good way, rather than a sucker kind of way. Not only that, but consider this. On the day you collect your Supreme from your dealer, start the engine for the first time and listen carefully above the wheezy hiss of the engine itself. You might just hear a descending whistling sound. That's the noise of the value of your chariot plummeting. Both the Saab and the Volvo, whilst costing nearly three grand more to buy in the first instance, will probably be worth at least four grand more than the Sabring when you come to sell it in three years' time. And another thing, ever tried selling a left-hand drive car second-hand? Well, you'd better be very fond of your Sabring because you might just be spending the rest of your lives together. Often as not, when choosing which car to buy in the real world, it comes down to personal preference brand loyalty, looks, economy, reputation are all prime factors. In the case of the Sabring though, sorry Chrysler, it's utter, utter pants. I can see no single reason why anybody could or should buy one. It's a convertible, you couldn't even keep chickens in the thing. Frankly, I can't see why Chrysler wastes the boat space bringing the things over from the US of A when you could use that same space for more useful things like chocolate fire guards or air. It may be just about acceptable over there, but over here, it's a big wobbly American car for big wobbly Americans. No thanks, Chrysler. And finally tonight, the news that the creative spirit is alive and well in Japan. This is the 26th annual Toyota Idea Olympics, which sets out to promote technological achievements in a fun and exciting way. If we thought Sir Clive Sinclair was a little wacky, just have a look at some of these modes of transport this year's entrants have thought up. 
You're not quite sure whether some of these Japanese inventors are hoping to be top designers at Toyota one day, or just having a laugh. Okay, maybe they're just having a laugh. The hall had fairly sensible stuff like virtual table tennis and a machine for sending things through tubes. But it was outside that the fun really began. Here's a scooter with an inbuilt flywheel system to keep the energy longer. Good stuff. But is it economical to make? That, of course, is another question. Now, what do you think this is? It's actually a three wheeled scooter. Not exactly compact, but a neat idea. Somebody here has invented a gearing system to get a wheelchair upstairs. Fair enough. But here, a robot pulling a rickshaw. Not exactly 21st century stuff, is it? Ah, but now we're really getting daft. Can this really be a wheel and leg contraption that only works if you're dressed as a teddy bear? But why cycle if you can surf? With this device, you can recreate all your surfing fun in the high street. And you'll have a ball with this mode of transport. Whistle to it and it glides up and opens up and then you sort of get on it and ride around. This is a friction ball device that works this strange vehicle. Not sure that it's going to take off though. But we really hope Toyota actually build this. What a great family MPV. It'd be like taking the family around in a mobile Mr Blobby. Fantastic, the fertile minds of the competitors at the Ideas Olympics in Japan. And we'll see you next week. Next week on Motor Week, Coronation Street's Scott Wright is a guest presenter when we look at style over substance. Do you go with your heart or do you go with your head? We'll see you then.